In this video, I'm gonna show you the VRO workflow that we're gonna kick off using a VRA subscription. Let's get started. Hi everyone, I'm Brian Watchers from Bavork. If this is your first time here and you wanna learn about automating, programming, and monitoring in VMware environments, you're in the right place. Start now by subscribing and click the bell so that you don't miss a thing. Welcome back. If you want to create an event subscription in vRealize Automation that will automatically call an orchestrator workflow when the event triggers, then you need an orchestrator workflow. So what I'm going to be doing in this particular video is giving you a brief introduction to the things about orchestrator that you need to know in order to be able to create event subscriptions in vRealize Automation 8. If you'd like to know more about vRealize Orchestrator, I have loads of video on that. Take a look up here at the info card and you'll see a playlist for Orchestrator videos. But right now, let's just focus on the things that you really, really, really got to know about Orchestrator to do VRA event subscriptions. Okay, here we are in the lab environment. And as you can see, I'm on the screen where I left off in the previous video. In the previous video and all the other videos before that one, I've been logged into vRealize Automation and specifically I've been doing things in cloud assembly. But what we're gonna be doing in this video is taking a look at another service in vRealize Automation, a service that's embedded in VRA specifically the embedded vRealize Orchestrator server. Now to see the vRealize Orchestrator server, I can uh, get there actually multiple ways. One way is to click on this button up here with the nine dots. When you click on the nine dot button, a screen shows up allowing you to, excuse me, a menu shows up allowing you to pick from any of the services that you're authorized to see, for instance, Orchestrator. So for instance, if I click on Orchestrator, uh, because we have single sign-on, I'm automatically logged in. Now I'm actually going to go back to Cloud Assembly for a moment here to illustrate another way that I like to work with vRealize Automation when I'm working with different services. Another way I like to work with the different services in vRealize Automation is to open up a new tab and in that tab go ahead and log into vRealize Automation. So click the go to log on page button but notice SSO says hey you're already logged in and so it's automatically taking me to the screen without having to type the username and password again. But what I like to do from this main screen here is to click on the other service that I want to look at, such as Orchestrator. And as you can see, I now have Orchestrator open in one tab and Cloud Assembly still open in another tab, which is rather convenient because that way I can just flip flop instantly between the two different services. So in order for event subscriptions to work, you have to create a subscription that points to the orchestrator workflow that you want to have run. So let's go take a look at a sample workflow that I've created. To find any workflow, either the ones I've created or the ones that are pre-built, or any workflow at all, we're going to go to the library section and click on workflows. And in here, you will see a whole bunch of different cards, each of which represents a single vRealize Orchestrator workflow. And out of the box, vRealize Orchestrator has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of workflows. Now, the one I want to look for, I've made easy to find by assigning a tag to it. VVORK is my tag. So let me say that's a tag search. And notice when I hit enter, all those hundreds and hundreds of workflows that are built in vRealize Orchestrator by default are filtered away. And all I see is the one workflow I'm interested in right now. This is a workflow that I've defined that we're going to call from our VRA event subscription. It's a workflow called log VRA event payload. Again, you'll recall in the previous video, I told you that vRealize automation, when it calls your orchestrator workflow, sends a payload of data. And again, that data in the payload is defined, remember back in Cloud Assembly, under Cloud Assembly, Extensibility, Event Topics, each topic, such as Compute Provision, has a schema that defines the information that's going to be sent in the payload from VRA to VRO. Let's go back to Orchestrator again here. 
And again, the purpose of this orchestrator workflow that I developed is to simply log various pieces of information that are being passed from VRA to VRO. So for instance, we're going to log um, the the um, payload information. Not all of it, but I'll show you how to log a few pieces so that you will be able to understand how to to extract and log and do anything you want to with any of the pieces of data in the payload. So let's take a closer look at this workflow by opening it up. And as we open it up, the first thing that we see is the summary tab. Uh, though it's not related to subscription specifically, this is where you can assign those tags like I was using a few moments ago. But what we want to do here for our purposes is jump over to the inputs outputs tab. Every orchestrator workflow uh, that we develop, we can define it as having certain things that it requires that the user, whoever's calling the workflow or whatever's calling the workflow has to supply these inputs. And similarly, we can also define outputs, which is information that's going to get returned to whoever or whatever is calling our workflow. If you want to create an orchestrator workflow that is going to be called from a VRA event subscription, you must define the inputs as you see illustrated here. You need to have a input parameter called input properties. It must be spelled and capitalized exactly this way. Notice the capital letter P. And that variable needs to be of type properties. We'll talk in a few moments about what a properties object is. But to keep that simple here, your orchestrator workflow that's going to be called from VRA uh, event subscriptions need to be an input called input properties, capital P, and it needs to be a properties data type. Then over here on this tab called schema, this is where in an orchestrator workflow we define what we want the orchestrator workflow to do. And we do that by dragging and dropping these elements that we see over on the right side, over, excuse me, on the left side, over to the uh, section here in the middle, which is uh, the blueprint, excuse me, the workflow designer canvas. Now, every workflow has a start schema element, and every workflow has at least one end element. And then we can add additional schema elements as we so choose. In this particular workflow, I added something called a scriptable task. I simply dragged it in here, changed its label to something more, more revealing. So this schema element is going to log the event payload information. And the, one of the defining characteristics of a scriptable task is it allows us to write JavaScript code that we want executed. So let me select the schema element and go over to its scripting tab. Actually, just before I do, remember the input variable that we defined before? You need to make certain that any schema elements that need to see the input properties, you need to have an inward binding to that same variable. You just come in here and say, I want this schema element, the scriptable task, to be able to see that input properties variable. All right, so back to the scripting tab. Again, this is where we're going to get to define JavaScript code to tell Orchestrator what we want to do. And uh, just before we look at, oh my gosh, scripting code, uh, please be aware that there are tons of things you can do in Orchestrator that involve no scripting at all. If instead of dragging in a scriptable task, which requires that I write scripting code, there are lots of schema elements that don't require any coding. But I intentionally created a scriptable task here to have complete control over what I wanted this workflow to do. We interrupt this video for a brief message. There's tons more information than I can share just in these videos alone. So see the YouTube description down below where you can find a link where you can find more information about how to join me in the classroom. We're returning to our previously scheduled programming. As you can see, it defines this mapping uh, structure here that allows me, if I know the topic ID of a event topic, I can map it to its friendly name. But we're not concerned about that right now, though if you're going to write your own orchestrator workflow to respond to event subscriptions, having a, uh, a map structure like that could be quite useful. But what I want to do here is zero in on specifically the pieces of information pieces of this code that know how to get specific types of information. 
Now, one of the types of information that's available to us in our orchestrator workflow is a collection of metadata variables. Now, we're going to learn more about these metadata variables in uh, one of the next few videos, but just using this one as an example, underscore, underscore, metadata, underscore, event, topic ID is um, a piece of information that I can extract in my orchestrator workflow so that I know exactly which event topic triggered. Now, in some cases, that's crucial. Other cases, it's not. In some cases, your orchestrator workflow that you're writing is only going to be called for a specific event event topic, and therefore there's no need to, to look up the, the dotted notation um, that identifies the event topic. On the other hand, in the case of this workflow, um, this workflow is designed to be able to be subscribed to for lots of different events. So I am getting in this line of code the metadata that tells me which event topic is um, which event topic is the uh, orchestrator workflow being called for. The other type of information that we're going to be able to get out of the payload is something called custom properties. Um, custom properties, by the way, if you're from VRise Automation 7, uh, you know about something called custom properties. These are kind of like custom properties from VRA 7, but they're different. So um, don't try to equate VR8 custom properties with VR7 custom properties. I'll show you how VR8 custom properties work in a video coming up here shortly. But if I want to get access to all the different custom properties, then I need to declare, um, well, first of all, I need to declare this variable I'm going to be using called custom properties is a properties object, just like that input properties object we saw before. What a properties object is, is a data structure that allows to store various pieces of information in what's known as key value pairs. Um, key value is just a tricky way of saying every piece of info, every value that we put into the properties object is going to have a key. Or if, if you don't like the word key, think label. Every piece of data we put in there Every value we put in the properties object has its own label or key. So what I'm doing here is saying that the custom properties variable that I'm going to be using here is a properties object. There's nothing in that properties object yet, but there will be here shortly. In this line of code, I'm going to put something into the custom properties object. What I'm going to do is go to the input properties object that I received, remember the input that we saw defined on the inputs outputs tab, I'm going to get the input properties properties object that got passed in and I want to extract just one piece of information from it. Now in this case here the the key or label for the piece of information that I want is literally custom properties with a capital P. By the way you have to spell and capitalize correctly. And I chose this variable name custom properties intentionally to match the label. So this is a variable. This is a key in the properties object. So in this line of code, what I've done is populate the custom properties variable with the custom properties in the input properties payload. And then down below, what that enables me to do is I can, as you see illustrated here, get from the custom properties object, various pieces of information that VRA defines. VRA defines something called a flavor mapping, and VRA defines something called an image mapping. Those are defined uh, in, the, in the VRA blueprint YAML code. We'll see that in more detail in a video or two. But these two pieces of code here are getting are getting information that VRA automatically puts into the payload. On the other hand, you'll notice here that I have a couple other keys in the custom properties properties object called user-defined variable string and user-defined variable number. Those are two user-defined, I define them, user-defined pieces of information that are specified in the blueprint and are automatically transferred by VRA when the event occurs, that information in the use defined variables is automatically transferred in the payload so that I can pick it up and do things with it. 
So uh, there is the code. You might want to take a few moments to study the code in more detail. Ultimately, all this code does is to log all these various pieces of information that we've been getting. And as you can see, uh, we have a bit of code here, but you might want your code to actually extract more information than just what I've shown you here. But the good news is, with these code snippets I showed you, you are going to understand exactly how to get the different types of information, all of the information in the payload. So we haven't talked about everything that's in the payload and shown you exactly what that is, but we'll see that in a video or two. And in the meantime, you already know the code that you're going to use to extract that information. Join me in the next video and I'll show you how to create a VRA event subscription.